feel uh, very well hosted by the local affiliates and uh, all of you who are, some of you I'm getting to know for the first time and old friends that I'm meeting again. Um, extensive reading has been a passion of mine. And when you get around extensive reading people, you find that it, you know, they're passionate uh, about uh, this method. Um, and I came to it though, uh, not through the Extensive Reading Foundation. Um, many years ago, I had a group of students at an intensive English program that I was, where I was um, working. And they came from, uh, they had high school diplomas, and they were supposed to be getting ready in a relatively short period of time for university work in the U.S. Um, but they really were not readers. And the more we investigated, we also discovered they're not readers in their first language. And they did come from a context where a lot of their education was oral and where they learned literacy in a classic language, but not actually the one that they communicated in on a daily basis. And while many of the students were more literate, we had a particularly tough group. And of course, their proficiency in English wasn't for academic purposes, was not going very quickly. So I, um, as a teacher who enjoys research, uh, but fundamentally a teacher, um, I just was reading every, everything I could. I was in graduate school at the time, so it was kind of normal anyway. And looking through the literature, where can I find out? What am I going to do with these people who have so much difficulty? They're adults already. They're not literate, particularly in their first language. What am I going to do? And I came across, not the ERF, I don't think it existed yet as an official entity. This was in the late 90s. And I came upon the Edinburgh Project for Extensive Reading. And I said, okay, this has got to be something good. And so I started communicating with what I call Keeper. Um, um, I got my school to spend money, you know, get it transferred into pounds and sent off to buy tests from David Hill and and then, of course, I came across the Day in Bamford text, which became, you know, okay. almost like the whole book for extensive reading for a while. And I was confused Some of the stuff this, like uh, the said that I think it's not too relevant to if we could find language materials that so I can know it. But uh, I offer some sure stuff that we switch words directly to the reader. But just to show this process, this process, the range of the scholar and the activity, and all in this fact that he has all these publications in English first. I thought that's worth it because it helped in fifth series, in fifth edition. And somewhere along the way, I heard about extensive reading. Well, use your judgment. For it. And of course, so the focus then, should be on really his contributions to ER in many different ways. And he participated in the two online. And um, wherever you are next time, I, I hope that I can still fly that far and come to that one. Unfortunately, uh, we don't have an affiliate in the United States. And that might be because people often think, well, one, it's a big place, a lot of people. Um, but I've heard it here and I've heard it elsewhere that people think that there's this huge difference between ESL and EFL. Well, after all, there's ESL students that got all that English around them. Well, you would think, but that is actually not reality. The reality is, and there's been research done on it, international students, when they leave the classroom, spend almost all of their time in their L1 cohort of students or local community. So, and being a very multicultural, multilingual um, country, especially in the larger cities, um, they can almost always find. Can we do that? Um, grocery stores, you know, restaurants. And now with uh, social media, um, the few surveys I've done, they are spending, honestly, some of them when they think come, are spending between Honestly, eight and 11 hours a day online. Outside yeah, of class. And that's all in their first language. We also have the situation where um, global politics, as they are, the student populations really vary over the decades about who's coming to study. And for them, for a large part in the last number of years, except more recently, um, many of our students, the highest group of students, come from China. And so I have found myself in the last couple of decades, or the last 10 years, very often teaching ESL to a homogeneous L1 group. 
What's the difference? I also found myself teaching in San Francisco, which really is a tiny city for the most part. And so these are students who spend almost no time in English outside the classroom. So I find myself actually, and many teachers like me across the US, in like circumstances to EFL contexts. They have the same social media opportunities, but in fact, they choose to stay in their in their This camera is his, his phone. That's the normal thing. Well, just imagine yourself. You know, his phone is just phone. broadcasting Usually we try uh, to find this picture to me. On, on so Zoom. once I got hooked up with ERF, I um, you know went gangbusters to see what I could do to implement that, and I can say that I've started several programs, and I've got some graduate and, students and out there who have started yeah. programs that we can't oh, see so to get administrators yeah. in the room um, to buy in at the same degree that individual teachers do, and so often these programs don't aren't sustained over time since they do take commitment. So that's how I got here, but. Along the way, I continue to do my own research and reading, which has led me, uh, of course, heavily influenced by many of you here, uh, been influenced by Paul Nation, and um, you'll see the citations throughout, Rob Waring, um, all kinds of people here, um, which made me kind of nervous about this presentation. I prefer to present in a country where nobody I refer to is in the audience. Where is this being? <laughs> Is so it I down the floor? That. So please, oh, Rob, don't you? Okay. Oh, so I, I, you know, charging. please. Uh, my I apologize about classes I got. Some lilies in there. I mean, I, if I got your dates wrong or something, I'll correct it later. Uh, but oh, I see. Yeah, okay. I really found myself um, considering not just ER um, or extensive. What is this? Which I've also implemented. And I'm going oh, to talk about that. you signed in. Um, I had it. I cut me off. Um, is really thinking about the balanced curriculum and recognizing the role that fluency building plays um, outside of extensive course. reading. Okay? So that's kind of the orientation that we're here today. Uh, yeah, but I have to sign in again. I'm uh, logged out. In, in front of you all. Many of you are doing the uh, things that I have talked about, but I do find that in in my yep. presentations, both in the United States it's and in it. other countries, that a lot of instructors have not had training in their um, in their graduate studies about issues um, around fluency. So that's where they are today. And apparently, there's a little delay. Powerful advance. I want to delay. Oh, yeah. sorry. <laughs> Hang on. <laughs> Try that again. Hi. Uh, Again, then just advance it. Yep. Okay. I did it. I throw away slide. I don't expect you to read it. But this is basically to say, you know, we know a lot already. I feel like there are some newbies in the crowd, but a lot of us know a lot already about the R and the power of it. Motivation and learners. It increases reading comprehension. It contributes to incidental and implicit vocabulary learning. And it increases learners' reading rate. And sometimes we refer to reading rate as fluency. And now, even after the short time that I've been here, um, I know more than I did before. And so you might wonder what I could possibly add to this. But I'm going to try in any case. So in fact, I don't know if that works again. I maybe wasn't pointing it in the right direction. All right. This is not a talk about ER, which is a little, you know, um, Gary at the ER conference. It's not a talk about ER, and it's not a talk about EL or the implementation of either of those. This is a talk fully focused on fluency. Next. I guess I'm just going to say next. Yeah. All right. Well, <laughs> hang on. We'll just talk here for a minute. So there are two she frameworks turn, that basically are shaping my comments today. One framework actually has to do with how languages are acquired. Um, although I was trained many years ago in different understanding of how language is acquired, I am not convinced. Um, huh? The pointer, the pointer isn't working. Now. 
yeah. a usage-based account. Huh? You know, so just type C. That's the one. Yes. You can actually um, uh, put it there. there. Yeah. Yeah. I don't and think we, we had it here. We moved it here. It would work here. So we moved it here. Oh, it doesn't work. It wasn't working. Yeah, it wasn't working. Well, if we have a different pointer, we can swap. If you can find another one. Even a balanced curriculum regardless of what scale you're using. Next. Next. All right. So just a quick overview of what I mean by this language or usage based <laughs> account for learning. So language learning has been described as an iceberg where only a very small portion of learning is declarative knowledge that happens above the surface. And that's the one where we have the most direct influence as language teachers. So classroom instruction very much it's gives working. us that declarative knowledge. No, I did that. Is it working? No. But what we all hope our students will get and what our students hope they will get is some kind of spontaneous use of the language, uh, which then often is very disappointing for them to realize they can pass a test and they can talk a lot about grammar, but they can't easily get into a conversation um, with you know, someone in that target language when they want to. So in fact, usage-based accounts of learning really tell us that way. the vast majority of what we learn in a language is learned implicitly. Um, and it is that intuitive, automatized ability to use whatever language you have at any moment in time. So my question has always been then, how am I going to do, if I only have access to this sort of conscious attention of my students in the classroom, what can I do that will actually turn more of my activity uh, into the kind of activity that will allow them to increase their interest in learning in the classroom? Since you did it. You did this already? No, no. Next. I realize now I should have taken out all of the advanced options. Okay, <laughs> so uh, Mark Seidenberg, who is a uh, psychologist who particularly looks at the, 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 the neuroscience actually behind learning, particularly reading, he talks about um, implicit learning as statistical learning. And I think um, when everything we no, are reading me. about um, artificial intelligence, she just the, staring and looking at it. begin to make more sense. So, oh, now it's like flying. I think she's doing Are you doing it? No, it's me. Okay, <laughs> All right, stay there. <laughs> Don't touch it. Let her try it. Might be. Yeah, it might be. I can't tell a joke for anything, but we'll, we'll turn it into a comedy here somehow. Okay. <laughs> All right, so you can read that faster than I can, but I really like this idea that, in fact, most of what's learning, what most of the learning going on is happening in the brain by noticing patterns and how things vary and how they fit together. And in fact, we know that we can teach things in the classroom and students can perform some use of that, whatever we teach, quite perfectly on a test, but put them in a spontaneous situation, completely gone. And of course, the most obvious for English, and this is true in many languages, or most languages, maybe all languages, but the obvious one for English is the present tense, right? Which, for who knows what reason, is always like the first chapter, except it's not used nearly as much as other forms in the language. And in fact, it's not salient in the input because there's only one morphine left or present, and it almost never impacts meaning. So in fact, it is acquired quite late. You can have highly proficient speakers of English communicating on very complex topics who regularly make errors with first person, right? But it's easy to describe. I think that's the only reason it's chapter one. Okay. So that kind of thing. In fact, when we put so much attention on some things, we actually can make it more difficult at times to learn them. What's important there is that statistical learning. She really, no, learning she stares at me. Without our conscious attention to it. It's happening behind our eyeballs. Um, when we are engaged with language. Okay, stop there. Okay. <laughs> okay, so uh, the typical language like, learning uh, uh, curriculum, and I take this from. Yeah. Uh, so uh, you, you can try it. Nation. 
I don't have a plan of oh, observation in there in 2020. It's a reiteration of things that have been published elsewhere. Uh, so we know that the first right. um, is, it, uh, is it okay? The situation helps in the classroom. Um, the, you know, the teacher usually initiates, there's response, they get some feedback. That's the traditional classroom setting. And that's not balanced. So I like to think of that curriculum as a uh, pyramid where language focused learning becomes the biggest part of the class. And if you look at textbooks, uh, as I do for my programs in the US, it's still, even if it's called content based, even if it's called communicative language learning. Working? We don't know. We have class, to wait for the yes for the chapter, I think it's working though. Oh, a okay. lot of it has a focus on language. I'll get a better one. Bottom button. Okay. So my sense of it is, and what appears to me, just me, my sense of it is, oh, oh, this, this wasn't in you all the way. Many people still use, even instructors use that everyday meaning of fluency, huh? which is the one that is very broad, which means I have great capacity in the language. Are you fluent in French? Okay, I'm not using that term in that way at all. Fluency here is one component of proficiency, it's the ability to use language with some degree of comfort, smoothness when needed, not error free not lexically perfect, but communicatively adequate in a situation. And it actually allows you to stay in a conversation with somebody because you got something out. I tell my students, if you can't introduce yourself fluently, you'll never be in the conversation to get more input, right? And as Paul Nation says many times, you should be fluent with whatever language you know. So, you know, right now I'm fluent in zero. Uh, Indonesian, so I can't even give you an example, but I am, uh, you know, I can say a few things in some other languages, and I better be able to say them easily, quickly, appropriately, when needed. Otherwise, that person will never talk to me again because that would take too hard. Okay. So, where is the fluency activity in the curriculum? If you look at the four circles, not balanced. So, let's just look at reading now as a separate case. And what we see is it's a cycle of textbook text, often very short, um, pre and post questions, interviews, activity, vocabulary and grammar tasks, sometimes personalized into, you know, what about you, right? Some kind of personalized writing, some discussion, but still we have to ask, yes, there is still language focus. And in some reading textbooks, it's more than the meaning focused input, which should be the reading, because in fact, the reading wasn't that long compared to all the other things you're going to do with the language in that reading. Meaning focused output, some reading, some speaking, okay? But where's the fluency activity? Not balanced. So when we talk about what would make it a more comprehensive reading curriculum, um, although I do rely a great deal on uh, Nation, Nation, Mary, and others in this area, um, reading experts um, all over have made it very clear that there is a component of teaching reading that is not about comprehension. Right? And if you look at number three, it's attention to. Okay. okay. Nothing happening. Attention to yeah. reading uh, fluency. So vocabulary building might be a part of reading after all. Some readers don't know words. Still didn't work. Right? Um, so we need yeah, practice. Yeah. The light doesn't turn on. So scholar at all uh, collection of in this article collection of some of the well known experts. Wait, you know, let's put it in. Um, Ray Poli Poliyama and Shabbat Shalom. They they about them. So right. And here we're focusing in. This is what they're saying about fluency activity. No, there's supposed to be a light. Yeah. The, so the red that? light. Yeah, that? forget that. At the word, at the phrase. Light? 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 Yes. In the back. In the back. And that was the part that I wasn't seeing. I had already implemented extensive reading. I had implemented extensive listening. Um, but and I certainly was using those to develop fluency. So I thought I was working on fluency, 
Um, but I had to really think much harder about that when I read comments like this. Yeah. And gone, when I started yeah. sort of oh, investigating fluency more generally, I uh, came across this formulation based on Sabella's 2012, uh, but slightly updated by Ophelia and Muta. And what we realized is that, okay, I, I need to know a great deal more about what fluency is. Uh, because I don't think that I'm using it in, in, in I'm giving a pretty narrow definition, and that has basically truncated then what I'm able to do in the classroom. So in this model, if you notice the Grave uh, comment on the side, he's really talking about his ability to very easily, quickly, without hesitation, automatically work at low level processes that are involved in meaning making, the use of language. And there's all kinds of different fluencies. And I think that if we look around in our curricula, the, the one place we will find information about fluency, it has to do with speaking. So very often people focus on speaking fluency, and there they might focus on pausing, speed of production, and um, repairs, things like that. Okay? I'm not going to talk about all of those. I became totally fascinated by those low level processes. What are those things that we can do for learners that will help them to make as much automatic and quick? Quick is not the same as automatic. So that they actually have working memory to engage in other aspects of reading, which have to do with ideas and inference and such. And this model really helped me to develop my understanding of that. So in fact, when you look at cognitive fluency, divided into two parts there, you can see that attentional processing, these are things that we actually use our working memory for. I realize there are different models of cognition, but a common model is that we have limited resources of uh, our attention. And so if we give attention to X, we can't be paying attention to Y, which is why we already know Extensive reading is so wonderful because it's not paying attention to accuracy. It's not paying attention to by checking people's comprehension. It's not paying attention to complexity. It's totally paying attention to meaning making at a very, you know, at an accessible level, right? So it's making it comprehensible, which means you have attentional resources to understand it. But remember, even the beginning of ER, students are still using their attentional resources to process sounds and individual words, right? How with extensive reading. Well, you gotta know a bunch of words, even at the lowest level, but those things can be difficult. And so I, I kept thinking about those very weak learners. How could I engage them in reading to build reading if I didn't do something to support, you might say, those lower level processes to become automatic so that they could start to comprehend that idea. So I'm interested in processing efficiency. So here's just a closer look. So processing efficiency um, has three characteristics according to O'Connor and Luke. I have not investigated this myself. I'm relying on their research. Um, and the idea here is that uh, speed, we understand, just do it fast. Okay. But the other two, here they use the word accuracy, but they're not talking here about grammatical accuracy on the surface. They're talking about basically the mental restructuring, which is necessary in language acquisition. You hear sounds and they have to mean something, and they don't mean the same thing in the same languages. Today, in one of the sessions I went to, I can't help this because I'm a linguist, but as someone was reading Balinese words, you know, I was already uh, checking the sound system. Oh, so that letter actually represents this fricative. Um, in my language, it does not. You know, that kind of thing. I mean, okay, not everybody is a geek like me, but the point is to understand we, the mind is doing that, right? The mind is doing it whether we're aware of it or not. And so the mental restructuring at the word, I mean, at the symbol, sound connection, at the word level, these things have to be restructured in the brain because we have restructured in one way in our language, and now we have to restructure them. But that restructuring actually is not a one once and done. If that were true, we'd all be out of the dog. 
Okay, you don't want to do that. It takes time with all of that covariating that Seidenberg talks about to actually figure out what the real structure is oh, in this situation. Oh, and in this situation. And so for that, well, you're you need to, oh, that's, you that's need to be able to make that connection. because no, I got to plug into the charging. With that's very it. little variability, right? It can't be some time and other time. It has to be every time. So basically, when you get this mental restructuring and you can do it regularly uh, and you can do it fast, you have well, higher that's true. processing yeah. efficiency, which frees up potential processes which are needed for other things that need to uh, happen. I can go and I can see it. It's the one to go to the No. <sighs> All right. This is perhaps a more normal. Forget it. That's me. I got enough power. Illustration of when we talk about it. It would be better nice to listen to the actual kind of to writing. And I have implemented ER principles basically across the skill. Um, and what we find is that there are these top down processes that require, and we do spend, you know, the pre reading and the post reading often is to build schema to actually those top down processes to help us okay. understand. But if we're not like parsing the syntax, if we're not understanding the lexical items, which is why we need to have such a high level of word knowledge, rapid, accurate word knowledge, right? 95%, some say 97%, because if that's not happening, we don't have the attentional resources to do the other things. So I, in my experience, if I can find texts that are really easy for my learners to access because they all are, I'm lucky, except for that one group, the students I have now, they're all literate in their first languages. So we're not teaching literacy for the first time, which is not my domain and, and has other issues. But if I can find texts that are easy enough for them that for them to access, they're already, they know enough words to be able to do the top down and the bottom up together and read efficiency. So efficiently. So basically for me, it's always a matter of finding the low enough text. But at that low end, sometimes it's getting difficult for me for you know better and better all the time with all the books that we have available to us. But what could what else could I do in the classroom that would increase their efficiency for engaging with ER and EL. So I kept looking for these bottom-up processes. Now, thankfully, um, there, there are books out there, have been studies done. It's not a great body of literature yet, um, but it is certainly informative. I'll mention a few things along the way. So that was the language learning principles that kind of brought me to where I am. And then of course, uh, really being influenced by the, um, the, trying to really, really think about that balance curriculum, particularly from the aspect of fluency. Um, as a teacher educator, I am privileged to be able to go and observe many, many classrooms and talk to teachers. And I don't know if it's entirely true, uh, of course, around the world, because I only live in one part of it, but it, it seems that very few instructors are able to articulate like what fluency means or what they could do to actually promote fluency in the classroom. Other than just sort of a general sense, well, if you get more proficient, you get more fluent. But that's not what I'm talking about. What were you doing? Just, and here just it was, the balance curriculum. Okay, I knew that. Oh, but lo and behold, this is the 2020. Uh, volume uh, by Rob Brady and Paul Nation. And what was really nice was, and I think it was not that I didn't know this, but I was still using ER and EL as my fluency activity. I developed a whole university course called Fluency Development 25% ER, 25% EL, 25% speaking for fluency, which was easier to find activities about, 25% uh, writing. Um, which was a little harder to find activities about. But it was during that process that I realized, okay, we can't, we're not going to just do ER, like 25% of the course in class. They did a lot of it out of class. What else can I be doing in class? 
And that's where I began to think about sort of this processing efficiency. And then when this book came out and ER and EL play such a significant role, not in the fluency category, in the meaningful input category, I thought, oh, I want to design a new course. Okay, um, where I would continue to do all of that, um, but really think about adding this other component. And I have been doing that and taking the process. I haven't convinced a lot of other people to do it. I mean, that's my problem. I don't have people, I don't know if you know them, who 25% of their curriculum are emphasizing it in that means in the classroom and out of the classroom, ER and EL as the major source of content. That's the content. That's the content we talk about. That's the content we write about. That's the content we discuss. That's the input. I haven't met that course yet. Okay. Is it changing? No? Meaningful is output. Okay. To be expected, those kinds of things. Um, and of course, language focused work, no problem, because that's everywhere. And then there was this fourth category, fluency. Now, they did fill this in, and I'll show you that in a moment. But the truth was, I could, I could see my way through all these, and then there was this fourth category. Well, what are they going to put in here? I thought it was E R and E L. I thought I was doing the right thing. So before we talk about what they put in it, let's go back to what Nation um, and others have reiterated, sort of the criteria, what makes it a fluency building activity. And these criteria are critical because if you have these criteria in mind, you can think about what you are already doing, even though I'm going to suggest a number that you could add, but you can think about what you are already doing and with small manipulations, you may be able to make things you are doing into better fluency building activities. So very important is that it does focus on meaning. So this is not, uh, again, we're checking for grammatical accuracy of any kind. It's can we understand it. So that already tells you, easy. Here's my textbook. Here are my learners. Here's my fluency building content, right? Everybody can access it for meaning. Lots of it. So repetition can be uh, perhaps a confusing term because it might make, maybe you're too young, but for me, it, 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 meaning, it makes me think audiolingual method, no, that. Okay. We're not talking about repetition that way because, of course, boring repetition where I just repeat the same thing to the same person is, is deadly and not useful. But with small manipulations, I can actually use the same or very similar language and make it practice by just manipulating a few things in the classroom, like different interlocutors. Okay. Is that working? Not again. Just the answer. Okay. Okay. Use very familiar content. Okay, this is not really introduced today. We're going to be talking about volcanoes. I mean, this has to be very familiar content. And I find, of course, what's more familiar than their own life lived experiences. So very often, right, it starts with their own experience. However, once you've been teaching, if you've been teaching in a content-based environment, once you've worked on content for some time, it should be the whole time. Can be no, no. familiar for everybody. It's, it's right? depressing. Well, you have to always check that though, because you know, it doesn't, it did they really do read through their homework? It's always a little bit of a you know, guess. But body. if you know that they're familiar, I with wonder them, if this is blocking. So their own right. cultures, their own okay. lived experiences, that's often where you start. It has to be familiar because we're not, we don't want their want them to be stressed about it and thinking just about that instead of trying to just spontaneously, easily talk through language. Is there anybody in the first row or second? Is it working? No. Okay, got it. Okay. And the last one, use time. Yeah, stop. Now that one, you know, all the rest of it seems stop. like so she's got heard all of those things from she's ER. Just, but time constraints is uh, a little different because we don't, you know, tell people, yes, please read your sense of reading, but you only have to 
Looking at where she is on the slides, we have a problem. 20 words per minute. We look and we find out what's their sort of normal rate, and we just say, go, read. And the students are all at different rates of reading. But when we do this repetition, sometimes we can add some time pressure. So if I've already had a possibility of sort of rehearsing what I'm going to say, and then I get or listen to, and then I get a, another chance to do it with a little time pressure, but I reversed it already. So it's not new, it's really familiar. And I'm not required to use the exact same words. It's only meaning focused, then I can do it a little faster. Sometimes learners, are afraid of going faster because they're thinking accuracy, right? They're thinking exact words, but we can convince them by giving them a little pressure to do it faster and realize, oh, communication happened. Okay, so I can produce this a little more smoothly. Not every task has all of these features, but you really can't do it if it's missing familiar. If it's missing familiar, then, then you've turned it into a difficult thing that makes it very hard to produce language easily. So in um, Nation and Wear in 2020, they do give some suggestions for the kinds of things, and they're very good in that balanced curriculum to find out that there are things to do in Can each of the five. five. Now, no each here, they do mention extensive reading, but they have the word easy. Okay. And when I look in the literature, uh, what I have found is that, um, yeah. again, I don't have the citation, I'm going to put it down here. Um, a study that was done with um, including She's advanced learners who were reading, doing extensive reading, that in fact, those um, who read way below their level, but because of that, read I guess you would be the person. It is done. Ask for Doreen. Can we put this on the internet? The yeah, I, who read what I can add to the bottom of your slide a URL. Can I give it to you somewhere? So it was just no, a little more, hear. Well, I guess, a little no. more stressful, even though they weren't aware of it. So the idea, again, that you just need so much language to enter your brain so your okay, brain is not going to work. Too much confusion. And yeah, all right, fine. You just I can't do it. Because it's such a pity. There's so much here, and she's not going to get it. Here except to say, I believe that many of these fluency building activities offer opportunities for volume in short periods of time um, that does actually increase the amount of English that's going into the brain. Okay, so here's that. These look like really fast I'm ones. Say yeah. much more. I'm not going to go into all of these. Good. I am giving a, a shameless plug. Uh, I am giving a workshop tomorrow afternoon where uh, we're actually going to do these activities uh, so that if, if you're there, you, you know, you learn them how, how they work. But there's a lot of different activities that can be done and that many of them meet these criteria. There's been research done on many of them. Sometimes it's, you know, it's quasi-experimental. Sometimes it's more like watching well, research. It's There's lots of room to do research. And I really encourage classroom-based no. action research. I know I'll work you may it not make it into the top journal, but it's so empowering <laughs> I, for teachers a, to investigate my own practices and to, um, you know, to, to really see evidence. Um, of what's going on. Yes. So, lots sure of things. Like and I, I've been oh, collecting, yeah, no, you know, I started out with one or two, and then I've been reading, oh, they mentioned one. Mention one. Oh, they mentioned one. And so, I've been reading one. There weren't supposed to be in slides. I was supposed to be speaking. You might find I didn't each want to one verbally appropriate and work well course. with your particular yeah. context. They typically mm -hmm. use about four different ones in a semester. And I highlight in one before university yeah. students. I, and then I alternate them through, uh, through exactly the semester. Um, also, the, the I usually don't do that. Our scholar at all. Uh, well, I mean, uh, Paul Nation has an introductory essay there, and he talks a lot about how to link up things you're already doing in the classroom to build familiarity with content, so she she and then to move it into a series of 
just thoughtfully so that there is a kind of a repetition that gets built in and she's you can even then uh, add some time constraints. So it's she not well as things. It's more about understanding the need for fluency and what are those criteria. But these exercises I find that the students have generally received them very well because it's a complete break from the textbook. And um, it, some of them feel a little mechanical. So they actually, and they're in, most of them are completely individual. And, well, I'll talk about later, but we keep track of it and they can see by these small steps, they begin to see changes in their ability to do these things and it becomes self-motivating. All right, we're not gonna, we're not gonna talk about all those, but you can see there's lots of them. So things that students say, of course, I have students, you know, always write journals. Um, and so they, they tell me things that they experience after we do uh, fluency building activity. I'm just going to show a couple more slides. So missing fluency seems good. Except if we talk easy now, we're talking easy like you wouldn't believe, right? Because we know that um, oral text flows by and then it's gone. And so we, we don't have a chance to look back at it. And so we really have to work with easy materials. Um, but it's, again, very important that we have lots of opportunities, but we can build up fluency. So here are just some, and there are others. I, I don't have as many. I'm not using as many, but I am using these, and again, we'll demonstrate them. Like, like the others, some of them have had some research on them. Others have not had research on them, um, but they're, they're um, you'll, you'll find out. Um, I went to, I presented on this, something like this at a conference not long ago, and there was a, uh, an instructor of French at a university in the United States. And uh, she went home and, uh, you know, this is, what, this is what I live for. She went home and she implemented a couple of these, um, the reading ones in her French class. And she texted me and she said, even the students who never participate, participated, it just changed up the whole class. It just added a dynamic that she had never experienced before. So it's really something different for most language learners. And again, we're not going to go through these, um, but these are these different oh, oh, people change. Well, let me don't listen to me. Hang on. Come on. You can do it. Oh, oh need to do it. it. Thank you. All right. Oh, keep going. This is a download oh, from okay. BBC Learning okay. Keep going. It's at your website. Keep going. Keep going. Okay, so we can't the students. Um, they are most surprised by this. Listening class is typically uh, a textbook. Is it you know, um, they, more for her than me. Yeah, I just follow. Listening is mostly um, practice of the same thing, comprehensive, almost like testing of your memory. I don't know, maybe because yeah. this is here. Even there is a place for strategy. Yeah, I hope so. Yeah. But we don't want to move it because there's also a, a Zoom connection. Ah, I see, I see. If you think about it, here's, here's a formula that you can think about your own teaching right now. What percent of your class teaching would be actually focused just on building fluency? This never is a whole class. That would be like deadly. All right. These are short spurts of activity regularly included in the curriculum. So we're I think that's one reason the students like it. It's just kind of a break, something completely different. Although some of them, like speed reading, it's exhausting. You know, when we're finished, they, they do like four, four like, speed reading texts and they're just going, like yeah. you know. So different ways, different ways of implementing. I, I include it with my ER component. So ER takes a lot of I think, necessary in-class training at the beginning. And then for me, it's mostly an out-of-class activity. Um, and then what do I do in class? Then I start adding in these fluency building activities for reading and likewise for listening. The instructor has an incredibly important role. One is that we have to convince students, we have to train students and convince them that this is effective for them. And, you know, 
some time ago, I was with um, a colleague, we were planning a new course, and as we were talking together, he says, you know, I've really only got one message for teachers. Um, he said it in slightly rough language, which I will avoid, uh, but he basically has one message for teachers. Be quiet and sit down. And that says a lot about a usage-based understanding of language acquisition. We have to back away and get the students using the language. And I had never thought about it before, but it came down to some of these things. I said, you know, I only have one message. And my message is, why are you doing what you are doing? I just firmly believe that teachers need to know rationale for the choices they make in the classroom. But in doing that, I've also discovered students need to know why are we doing this? And even relatively, I, I'm not talking like elementary school, but even junior high level, they're happy to know if there's a research-based reason why we do. We're not doing this for fun. We're not doing this because you're falling asleep. You're not doing this because I just really am mean and want you to work hard. You're doing this because this supports language learning. And here are the reasons why. And then when you keep track of the changes they make in their fluency journal, they begin to see the changes that are happening. And sometimes, in one study I did, um, at the end of the course, it was a literacy course for college students, and there were many things that happened, but I insisted that in all three levels, they had to do fluency writing. And at the end of that, the interviews that I did with 90 students, they all said, the thing they liked more than anything else in the class was the fluency writing. I'm going, so what? You can write faster. And they said, well, I can write faster so I can take notes better in class. Yeah, like, really? Oh, okay. About 30% of them said, when I write faster, I get better ideas. And that's exactly processing efficiency. Produce the language with more automaticity, with more speed, and I have attentional resources to do other things. Thank you.